So put yourself in the creation uh, bucket. Be a creator, not a waiter. Uh, and uh, keep adding skills. And it'll all work out. It really is that simple. But people want to believe that it's difficult. It's not. If you just keep adding to your skills and then you demonstrate to the world that you have those skills, the world will email you and knock on your door. The end. Jason Calacanis, the world's greatest moderator, co-host and bestie on the All In podcast, and one of the best angel investors in the world. It is so great to welcome you on the show. And Jason, great to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you, Julia. Well, I'm excited to have you on. And I, you, I have to say, Jason, you are my favorite bestie on the All In podcast. And oh, say more. You've really, I got to say, you've grown on me so much because when you're not on the show, I'm so bummed because you really are the world's greatest moderator and the best point guard. And I have to say, I think what I love the most about you is you make everybody better. So I just want to put that on the record that from one you moderator are and host to another, I, that means a lot. You know, um, I did miss two episodes. Uh, recently, I was traveling and, and doing a bunch of stuff, and um, one of them was Jared Kushner, <laughs> and uh, the other one was another one. And you know, uh, I did get a lot of feedback. Hey, we missed you. Uh, you know, needed you there to maybe ask a tougher question or two to, to Jared Kushner. Um, but yeah, I think it's a fine episode without me. But uh, the MAGA folks were thrilled I wasn't there. They hate me. <laughs> and then everybody else who's you know, true fans of the show are like, it's not the same when one of us isn't there. And, and that that's kind of the truth. It's all for one and one for all okay. in the All In Pod. Uh, you know, when Freeberg's not on, there's like a whole, you know, large portion of the it's very upset. Where is he? Come on, we so want science. True. When Sachs isn't on, people are like, I need my red meat. You know, Ukraine update, you know, politics, whatever. And then when Jamat's not there, you lose markets, you know. So each person has a great role to play. And it's kind of like a band, you know, in many ways, like uh, the Beatles or something. Everybody's got something to contribute. Uh, and it's, I think the last, today's episode is pretty great. The last two are pretty great. We had Dean Phillips on and then Tucker. So a little, you know, left, a little right. And then today was, this week's will be, a hundred percent, just a classic all in going through the news, finance, et cetera. Yeah, I love it. And like you said, it's just it's it's like a band. And um, I feel like you like let everyone play to their strengths as well. Well, I know you just wrapped up a recording of the yeah. all in and uh, this show. We normally start with like, what's your assessment of the economy? But I actually I am curious because I, ha- I imagine we probably know some of the topics that came up and I was watching just some of your recent tweets and even the last episode with that you did with Tucker was incredible. So just kind of what's happening this week, um, the despicable display that we saw on Capitol Hill from academia, from three of the top institutions. Can I just kind of start there and get your pulse as to like your reaction and, and we can start to tease that out a bit too. Yeah, it's very simple. I mean, if somebody asks you if um, threatening or wishing for genocide against another group of people is bullying or harassment, the correct answer is yes. Now, granted, I didn't go to Harvard or MIT, um, but I, I think it's a pretty easy answer. And I think, you know, when you saw this weaselly, you know, answers, I think uh, these individuals who are running these institutions um, have maybe gotten lost in you know, the dead end of identity politics. Uh, I am a moderate, but left-leaning. Uh, I believe the government, you know, largely should stay out of your life. I believe in personal freedoms, but I, I, I deeply care about human rights. Um, and the, these institutions have been anti-free speech and have gotten all upset about microaggressions for the last 20 years and, you know, some buddy like Ben Shapiro comes to campus and there's riots and buildings are getting windows broken and he has to have 20 security guards. Listen, I'm, I'm, he's not, we don't, I don't agree with, you know, 80% of, of Ben Shapiro's political positions, I'm sure, but I'm not bent out of shape if he comes and talks. But then these folks are, can't just say, yeah, you, you can't chase Jewish students around the campus and tell them you wish that there would be genocide of their race. And there's a very simple intellectual test that I always put through. And again, I didn't go to Harvard, not the smartest kid in the class, but you know, I grew up in Brooklyn and we're kind of straight shooters and honest uh, and, and we call it like we see it. You just replace 
Jewish? And did you wish for the genocide of black people? Did you wish for the genocide of women? Did you wish for the genocide of trans people? Did you wish for the genocide of Catholics? Just just pick any group, any group. And if you were to phrase the question like that, there would be absolutely no moral question that you should, it is bullying and harassment to wish for the annihilation, the destruction, the, the death of every trans person, of every black person, of every Asian person. Now, of course, with this group of individuals, they might actually be totally fine with you wishing for genocide of Asian people. Because I think in their minds, and this is the real perniciousness of identity politics and and then the victim politics, um, is that when you start trying to keep a scorecard of who's more oppressed and who's oppressed each other, and well, you're a woman and you're a white woman, Oh, and you're straight or you're gay, and that, this is one minus one point, plus one point for your victim status, et cetera. You know, Martin Luther King was pretty straightforward. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, when, when somebody as enlightened as him says, we want the, the goal is to be in a society where we're judged on our character, not the color of our skin, but just, you know, our, our character, our performance in the world. Um, that's obviously the goal. And I think these places got hijacked by a bunch of, you know, perhaps they had a good idea here. Hey, maybe there's inequity in the world that we should work on that. And yeah, maybe there are victims in the world. So yeah, you want to have compassion for them, but that can't be the overriding principle. And I think what we've seen here is maybe, and I don't want to use the word woke because then it's like, oh, we're, we're trying to troll one group or the other. I, I like to use actually their language, which is identity politics, right? And I, I think this is where identity politics leads you is it's just a dead end and you get to that dead end and you realize nobody feels good. This is not what America is about. When you and I grew up, we were told the best part about America was that we all assimilated and it was the melting pot and that we all came, we brought uh, whatever we brought from the old world and that we learned this new uh, you know, stack of beliefs and, and uh, goals and, and we had that in common and we became Americans. We could be Irish American. Native Americans were here before us, obviously, but you could be Japanese American, et cetera. And we could all just contribute to this. And and now that's cultural appropriation. And so I think the world now is kind of at the end of this hand-wringing identity politics madness. And we need to get back to, hey, what does America stand for? We all came here. You can keep all your traditions all you like. That's beautiful, wonderful. Food, culture, religion, writing, media, poetry, whatever it is, music, dancing, but what does it mean to be American? And what, what is the American vision here? And I think that's what most Americans want. And we, we want to get along with each other. And so I, I yes. was absolutely disgusted, but not surprised by it. I think they showed us their true colors. And when people show you who they are, you can believe them and they should fire them. They should all be fired. They should all resign. It was absolutely morally bankrupt and disgusting. Yeah. You know, Sorry um, to go on a tirade, but no, I, you know, I'm so upset no rules about on, it. It's just really yeah. infuriating to me. On this show, Jason, like I, what I love is I love to listen and let mm. my guests speak uh, as long as they'd like uninterrupted. And you are so valued and I love hearing from you and I love learning from you. So a few things I want to just sure. explore a little further. As you point out, it's not what America is about. And you point out this question of like, what does it even mean to be an American? And you know, when I read your book, Angel, like oh. I-, I see you as kind of the epitome of like the American dream, if you will. And so I want to kind of put that question back on you is from your perspective, what does it mean to be an American? And maybe I'll make it a compound question. What do you think all of this says about society? I guess like maybe some of our underlying challenges that we face. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with the second part. I think we've drifted because we have so much abundance in America. We're at the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. Um, you know, we're Gen Xers. We remember a couple of wars that were small groups of, you know, soldiers with drones. And we might have had a couple of friends who were in the military, but these were very strategic wars. There wasn't a draft. Um, we've lived in a massive uptick of the stock market, jobs, opportunity, technology. Everything's gone so great. And with the exception of, say, 9-11, and a couple of recessions here or there that we we, we, we worked out, those are normal and a part of the process, uh, my generation, Gen X, and, and the subsequent ones, we haven't had a ton of hardship. And when you have a lot of abundance, you got a ton of, and you don't have hardship, 
uh, you know, people literally have to jump in cold plunges to feel uncomfortable, right? People are looking to feel uncomfortable because it's so easy in America. Nobody in America is going to starve. And then you, you look at the things that ail us, it's depression, it's suicide, it's people committing suicide through opioids and addiction. That is actually a sign of abundance. The fact that we are killing ourselves through obesity, we're killing ourselves through fentanyl and opioid addiction. These are things that happen when you have this massive amount of abundance. And the fact that like in America, life expectancy has kind of leveled off and maybe even trended a little bit down because of obesity, because of suicide, because of suicide through opioids. Um, these things are a sign of a, a society with too much abundance. Now you have this idle mind, it becomes a devil's playground. And so then your mind starts attaching to other things. We want to be part of something. And so you could attach to you know, something happening in civil rights. You could attach to something happening in politics, MAGA, woke ideology, whatever it is. Um, but you're not being productive uh, in those pursuits. You're being destructive. And I think what America is at its core is optimism and creation. And you know, entrepreneurship and capitalism, you can do a ton of um, analysis of it and you can be highly critical of aspects of it. And I, I don't disagree with uh, the long list of reasons of why capitalis capitalism needs to improve and the problems with it. Uh, but it's the best operating system in the world. Democracy plus capitalism has resulted in the most gains for humanity, not for just Americans, for humanity in the world. Why? Because innovation and competition, it eventually makes its way to everybody. So if we take but the iPhone as one example, a smartphone, you know, it's made in China and that has taken hundreds of millions of people as has Amazon and people shipping products cheaply uh, to the Amazon marketplace. That has lifted, not only made America and, and Americans uh, daily standard of living more rich and easier, more delightful, more efficient. It's also raised 400 million people, I believe, out of poverty, uh, abject poverty in China, right? And that's capitalism at work. You even look at China. In China, they embraced uh, you know, capitalism without changing the communist uh, operating system. So they kind of added the best of America, which is capitalism and creation, to that operating system, communism and central control. So that authoritarianism with capitalism even worked for massive productivity. And then what happened? Xi Jinping decided, you know what? I'm going to start shutting down these companies. I'm a little threatened by Jack Ma. I'm going to get rid of the education ones. This feels unfair. We need a little more communism in this mix. Capitalism went too far uh, in China and we're going to decouple and their economy crashed. And then he just came to San Francisco and he's like, hey, I want to meet with business leaders. I made a mistake. <laughs> no, he didn't say that, but it's pretty clear by his actions that he wants peace and he wants people investing in China again. Because what happened was all those dollars, venture capital dollars, private equity dollars, factories being built, People didn't stop innovating. They just moved them to Vietnam, India, Pakistan, you know, and, and other countries in the region. And so he basically uh, ankled himself. And so this is what Americans need to realize. We need to champion people who are innovators. We need to champion capitalism, being productive, having big, audacious dreams, having skills, working hard, and then getting rid of this victim mentality, which the rest of the world looks at us and says, you're victims? It really? Oh, because you have the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. You have massive numbers of calories. You're all obese from eating so much. Uh, and you know I, I, the rest of the world's trying to get into your country and you're not letting us in. There's a reason why everybody wants to be here still to this day, even with all of our dysfunction, political issues, polarization, tribalism, whatever. Still the best country in the world, hands down. And so I'm more optimistic than ever. I think a lot of this hand-wringing, what we saw with you know, Harvard and MIT and all this nonsense. I think it's part of the process with Trump. It's part of the process. It's a messy process, but it keeps trending up and to the right. And so I am still optimistic, uh, even with the polarization and a lot of the stupidity. Yeah. You know, it's um just this notion of, you know, part of the problem being ab abundance. Um, Going back to the episode that you all did with Tucker Carlson, which was a tremendous episode. Everyone go listen to it. Probably one of y'all's best performing, I imagine. It'll be in the but top the five for sure. Yeah, of all time. I'm yeah. guessing. 
Well, even on like an individual level of prosperity, you know, someone like yourself who's attained success and wealth, what kind of happens when you catch the car, if you will? Like, how do you think about that or, um, you know, maybe more on the micro level versus the macro level? So for individuals, um, you know, we're living in a very dynamic time and a lot of young people ask me now that I'm old uh, and they want me to invest in their companies, et cetera, how do I be successful in life? And so at constantly adding skills and taking a risk and creating new things in the world is the path to outsized wealth and success and happiness. And, you know, you want to put yourself in a place where you're surrounded by other driven people who are also capable and then you want to remove yourself from situations where you're with victims, complainers, whiners, people who want to tear it down. And so if you can, go work at a startup. Uh, and really the best place to do it is when a startup's at like maybe seven to 50 people, seven to 30 people. They've raised a couple of million dollars. Maybe they've gotten to a million or $2 million in revenue. So it's probably now in the top 5% of companies created because it's gotten to a certain amount of velocity. It's kind of on the um, launch pad or it's just started to go up in the air if it was a rocket. You want to get on one of those rocket ships, get a seat, and then just watch the magic and learn. And you want to work really hard. And it's incredibly triggering. And I do it on Twitter all the time, mostly for my own entertainment. Uh, but also I'm speaking to the 5% or 10% of people on Twitter and you know 90% of my following, which are entrepreneurial. And I will just tweet something like hard work pays off. This is the most triggered thing in the world for somebody who has a victim mentality to hear that hard work pays off. No, it doesn't. And you know, if you look at skills, when I was coming up, I tried to, you know, as a kid from Brooklyn who went to night school at Fordham, took me four and a half, five years to graduate. I had to be a bar back and fix laser printers to pay the tuition. I didn't have a scholarship. I didn't have uh, parents who could afford to pay for it at the time. And so, you know, I had to hustle my way through it all. And it was very um, clear to me that, you know, there were skills that I couldn't find and, and answers I couldn't find because the internet was just getting started. And over time, the ability to learn a new skill is on YouTube. The ability to take a course from MIT is free on Coursera or edX. And I sometimes will sit, you know, I put the kids to bed. I have three daughters. I'll go to, you know, my wife goes to bed early. Dogs, you know, bulldog at my feet, laying on my feet. I'm at my desk. And I'm having a cup of tea and uh, you know, I'm just getting through some work and I'll put on in the background a YouTube course from MIT or Harvard about macroeconomics or artificial intelligence. I'll just listen to it. And I'm like, wow, these videos of a course at MIT on artificial intelligence are for free on YouTube. And then I look at the view counts, it's 400,000. I'm like, Gangnam Style's got, and Baby Shark have billions and this one, hmm. 400,000. What we don't have, all the information is now free and available. So for everybody who's a victim with things that, you know, they've been locked out and that the world's against them, everything's conspiring against them. Yeah, sure. There could be racists who are conspiring against you and they hire somebody who looks more like them. Sure. But the information's there and the skills are easily attained. So if you stop watching four or five hours of TikTok and Netflix, which is what the American uh, Americans do on average, four or five hours a night, of watching videos and social media, just take three of those five and put it towards your personal development skills. Now, I know it's hard because those things are designed to be super compelling. And listen, TV, we're, we're in the golden era of TV. I love it. It's incredible to see these shows. And yeah, TikTok is super addicting. But just carve out half your time, two hours a night, and, and do 500 hours on web design or UX design or marketing, and you will have a job. And then do some spec work. Do some work without any idea of getting paid. Now, if I say that, all these victims will say, well, well, I'm not getting paid for that. And I'm like, yep. And therefore, you're never going to get anywhere. I have had people make you know, different things online, websites, apps, little things to kind of impress me. And it works. So I look at it and I'm like, wow, that's really impressive. Um, do you think that could be a company? And this company, Podcast AI, you know, made like little AI videos of the All In podcast. And they said, hey, we want to make a podcasting platform using AI. And uh, the thisweekinstartups.com website is actually driven by their platform now. They take every episode, they transcribe it, they make the show notes, they tell you the viral moments, uh, and they 
basically do your entire website in production. Like it's a, it's a producer Nick in a box. It only does about half of his job, but it does it for 500 bucks a month. And I wound up investing in that company because the person impressed me so much with the work they were doing for free on the web to impress people. So put yourself in the creation uh, bucket, be a creator, not a waiter, uh, and uh, keep adding skills and it'll all work out. It really is that simple, but people want to believe that it's difficult. It's not. If you just keep adding to your skills and then you demonstrate to the world that you have those skills, the world will email you and knock on your door. The end. That's amazing. You're so right, though. That And like the, all the great things in life, they're on the other side of going through something really hard. Um, and I'm finding that even as a creator myself. And speaking of learning, I learn a lot from listening to the All In podcast every week. It's been a ritual since 2020 for me. And I know it's ritual for so many folks, just the success of it. So you've already, you were kind of already like a podcasting magnate yourself. Talk to me about the All In pod and did the success of that one surprise you? Yeah, you know, people have tons of questions about it. We generally don't do much press on it. We've agreed to not do press on the All In podcast and let the podcast basically speak for itself. Um, to your question about did it surprise me? Yes, of course. Um, it was just a way for the four of us to catch up with each other during COVID and we published it. Uh, last week, we were the number 10 episode in the world. And uh, it's it, the thing that surprised me most is that it, it left the very niche audience of startups and venture capital, which this week in startups, I've done 1800 episodes of that is very much entrenched in there. You can't watch that show. That show does not appeal to somebody who's a neophyte or not in that vertical because I talk about startups and venture capital and that's it. It's a very narrow mission. Um, but all in, we started talking about COVID. We started talking about politics. We started talking about science, markets, whatever, pop culture. And uh, for some reason, and, and you know, lightning in a bottle, you know, having you know, had the number one blog in a world in the world at one point in Gadget, uh, which I sold to AOL. Uh, that Peter Rojas, uh, Sean Gold, and uh, Brian Alvey were my partners on, and um, that blog was number one in the world, and it was lightning in a bottle. And it had a magazine, Silicon Eye Reporter, which became like one of the top five magazines in uh, the tech industry in the '90s. So I've seen lightning in a bottle happen, and um, yeah, you know, you never know. I've created another hundred brands in my career. <laughs> over 30 years. And, you know, like five of them have hit that lightning in a bottle. So it's usually one in 20 or something like that. And this one is at a level that I don't think any, I know none of us expect. And it actually has, you have to be very thoughtful when it does happen. I, I've had to become incredibly thoughtful about how I present my ideas in the world. And, you know, because there's a lot of people watching and, and people count on us to uh, help them understand the world. So, you know, as it's gone up, we've had to take the work very seriously, I think, and still have fun. So it's it's a balance. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, like I'd love to ask a few more questions just because some of the things that I really like about the show, for example, you know, having the presidential candidates on for a couple of hours where the four of you are asking questions, it's a great way to hear someone's perspective without, you know, being confined to a short sound bite, whether it's on a debate stage or um, in a more mainstream interview. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever see a future where would you guys like ever do an all-in debate where you'd have, have all asked. of the candidates? People have asked, and I think it would be great to do. Yeah, um, you know, we had uh, we were the first to have RFK on, and he attributes a lot of his success to us being the first place where he got to talk widely. And um, we try to make it a not a safe space, but a comfortable space. And the the technique is to just let people talk and to ask them, you know, important questions. And we're not trying to be gotcha journalists where we're trying to say like, oh, you eight years ago said this thing and it came out wrong and it's stupid or you made this mistake and you tripped and you fell. Um, ha ha. What we're trying to do is actually, what is the important topic? And so, you know, I, uh, when we had Vivek on, I asked him, hey, you know, uh, about this trans issue. Do you think trans is a mental illness? Because you, do you think being gay is a mental illness? You kind of come out as being pretty... I don't want to say anti-trans, but you know he's got very strong feelings about it. Um, and you can watch that clip. And we were able to ask him a, like a very nuanced question about something that is normally, I don't know, very polarizing and not taken seriously. And, and you can get to, I think, what most Americans want, which is 
like a deeper understanding of where the person is coming from. And politicians are hard. We just had Dean Phillips on, and he's awesome. Um, and you know, he would give a really great answer, but then sometimes he would dip into like a political stump speech. So you know, you ask a question about mm-hmm. A, and then all of a sudden they kind of answer it and then go to C. Um, and it was I had to wrangle him a bit to to get him to you know do the all in format, which is hey, let's have a conversation about the real issues. You don't need to try to do the stump speech thing. And you know. Um, I think Chris Christie was probably the best at it. People came away from the Chris Christie interview and I got a lot of people telling me like, wow, I really like that guy. There's a lot to like there. And uh, I, I, I do, do enjoy those. I've enjoyed all of them. And you know, I hope we have Biden, Trump, and Nikki Haley on. They've all been invited. And I think we'll probably get a couple of those. Yeah, I, I think a debate would work great uh, as well. Um, you know, When something becomes successful, everybody wants to co-opt it, bolt onto it, make it into something else. And that's why try not to speak for the pod all that much. You don't see me, like we're not doing Wall Street Journal profiles and all those things. And people have asked to do those. And I think the pod speaks for itself. You're a fan, so you know. Um, We're just four individuals trying to learn and evolve and understand the world better. And then some people appreciate that. And we we appreciate those people. And the community is really the biggest part of this. Uh, The two all-in summits we did, I did did the first one and Freebird managed the second one. I mean the the extraordinary conversations and the and the audience was the was the best part of it. Meeting the fans, they're really intellectually curious, open minded, driven people. Best of America, you know, to our previous conversation. Hey there, I just want to quickly interrupt the video and just say thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this channel and choosing to watch this interview. I hope that you are enjoying it and I appreciate you visiting the channel. If you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. It's totally free and it will keep you up to date on all of my interviews. I post two interviews a week with some of the most incredible people in in finance and investing and your support will help me bring in some more amazing guests. If you already are one of my subscribers, thank you so much. I cannot express to you how much your support means to me. I am incredibly grateful that I get to do something that I'm truly passionate about. And you being there week after week, it not only gives me that energy, but it just gives me that faith to keep going. And it means everything to me. And I love seeing you all in the comments section. I love interacting with you. I love interacting with you on email or social media. I just love hearing from you all. And I just appreciate your support so much. I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do something that I just love. So I just want to say thank you and appreciate you subscribing. All right, back to the interview. Yeah, well, I attended both of them. And I have to say as a woman and someone who's attended, I don't know how many, oh, I have all these conference badges back here, a lot of investing conferences. Mm-hmm. I have to give you guys props because it's just the people that you have there, the diversity of the guests as well. It was so welcoming. And so that's really appreciated as someone who listens to the show. But just being being in a room where you're like, okay, I'm not the only woman in the room. It's really nice just to see. And I know that was really intentional and it was appreciated. Yeah, um, it it was very intentional for the first one. I've been very public about this. I've said it on stage. I've, I've talked about it. Um, you know, I just looked at the numbers and having run conferences for a long time, they're typically 90% male uh, in our industry, tech or finance. And so... You know, we had a scholarship program where we asked people to apply, and then we just try to balance those numbers out. And you, you probably saw about, you know, the first one, I think it was high 30% female. Last one, similar, maybe just a little bit behind that number. Um, and so we just try to balance the audience out a little bit so it's not just a dude fest, which is really boring. And, uh, you know, if you look at the the world as currently done today, these conferences are expensive. The people who can do them tend to be CEOs or fund managers, and while in, in those positions, you they're just in finance and tech. The top positions are still primarily male. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of females in the industry, but then the ability to pay for that ticket requires asking somebody to get approval, and then that approval either never comes or the person doesn't feel comfortable asking for it or taking the time off. So you have to kind of, again, you know, maybe a little controversial, but. Uh, quality, equity, whatever, I personally uh, believe it's a more interesting event when we have more diversity there. And also younger people in the part of that, you want to have some young people there too, right? And young people can't afford the tickets uh, to a lot of these events. And when I went to my first like um, 
Uh, Esther Dyson used to, uh, she gave me a free ticket to PC Forum when I was up and coming in my career. So I got to go to that. And uh, Tim O'Reilly gave me a free ticket to ETAP one time because I was lobby crashing. You know, I've been lucky to be on the other side of, uh, you know, getting a, a discount or a free ticket. And yeah, I was appreciative. Yeah. Okay. If I know you guys don't monetize all in pod, but could you ballpark it? Like, what would be the economics of it? Like, I don't know if you can even share that, but you know, you know as a top 10 curiosity. podcast, it would make 25 to 50 million a year, uh, which is what the other ones okay. make. So we're probably being 25 million on the table a year at a minimum. Yeah. Hmm. She would make 500,000 wow. a week. Yum, you know. yum. I want to 500,000 a week. But you know, that one. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I, I, I kind of, it was Tremont's decision to not do ads, I think, originally. Um, and uh, I think it was one of the more brilliant decisions we've ever made. So give, give Chamath yeah, and Sachs yeah. a lot of credit for that. They, I think Chamath was the first one. Like, yeah, I don't want to do ads. I was like, I'll read them. I'll sell them if you want. Put them at the end. They were like, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to be associated with reading ads for SaaS companies. And I was like, I do. <laughs> They're like, ah, <laughs> no, nah, we don't need the money. I was like, we don't. <laughs> Pretty fun. We talked about that. I on love the show it. Too. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed um, preparing for this interview because I learned a lot of you know fun facts oh, about you. So I want to pivot time. a little bit. This is a fun fact. You have the first tesla model s i believe in the 16th roadster yeah, sure. so what's the story behind that how did you get number one uh so uh the 16th roadster uh, I'm, I'm obviously friends with elon and uh you know it's you gotta be careful when your friend becomes as popular as elon has become in the world because you know if you say you're friends with somebody people think you're trading on their name and or you're you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but a couple of my friends have become very famous. Uh, so I'm always very, you know, uh, sensitive to not trying to uh, ever leverage my friendship with folks. Um, but in the early days, I was trying to support him because Tesla was failing. And uh, I tried to get people to buy the Roadster and tweeted about it, constantly talked about it and gave people. In fact, I just told anybody who would come to my office in Santa Monica when I lived in L.A., if you want to go for a ride in the road, sir, I'll take you for a drive because they, they weren't exactly selling like hotcakes at the time. It was a very expensive car and it was a bit of a raw experience. And so I had bought the 16th one for 150K. It's now worth 250K. So it went down to like 40K because nobody wanted them. And then it's become a classic now. So if you hold on to things long enough, they could, they could go up in value. Um, but what happened with the Model S is an interesting story because Tesla was going out of business the first time it was running out of money. And uh, Elon and I had dinner. And we we're having steak at Boa in Los Angeles. And it was, you remember the stories that they were had two or three weeks worth of money left in the bank. And um, I was trying to cheer him up. And I said, hey, is there any good news? Uh, and he had run out of money. Uh, and I said, well, I got a couple million bucks. I wasn't uh, you know, where I am today. I said, I can loan you like maybe three million bucks or something. He's like, don't bother. It's just going to, that'll be like a week's worth of payroll or two weeks, it wouldn't matter. Uh, I said, well, is there any good news? And he said, well, and he took out his Blackberry and he showed me the clay models of the of the Model S. Now, the roaster was the only thing I said, don't tell anybody. And he started flipping through you know, with the little Blackberry ball, <laughs> showing me these little pictures. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what is that going to cost? And he said, $50,000. So, wow, if you make that car, you'll change the world like for $50,000, right? 150 to 50. Now, it, eventually he got there, Model Y, Model uh, three, I think, are under 50. Model Y is maybe just above 50 and Model 3 is under 50. Um, but he didn't get there with that car. Um, so I went home and I was like, I was talking to my wife, Jade, and it's like, Elon's, you know, he's in bad shape. I don't think Tesla's going to make it. And the rocket ship company, they blew up two rockets in a row. The second one kind of almost made it. Um, and uh, he's going to go bankrupt. And uh, I said, I'm going to buy two of his cars. So I just wrote a note. Um, loved the new car, I'll take two. And I put two $50,000 checks into FedEx and I sent it to his office. Uh, or I might have had my assistant drop it off just to kind of make his day and let him know that he had the first two customers, my wife and I. And uh, three years later, uh, he saved the company. He wound up raising the money. Um, and uh, three years later, I got an email, your signature reservation number is 0001. Your signature reservation is 0073. And I emailed him. I said, I can't take the first one. He said, well, there's actually like 20 prototypes and I'm giving those to, you know, I think Larry and Sergey and Steve Jervison, you know, they all, I think, and Steve Jervison got the first prototype. Um, but Elon doesn't care about the prototypes or stuff like that. He's just more interested in the mission. Uh, so I think he let his investors have all those. And then I got the signature 001, uh, which I've been offered a million dollars for and I haven't sold it. Uh, and that was 100 
fifty or sixty thousand when I bought that one. So I'm thinking of putting the two of them in a museum, maybe like the Smithsonian might want. And I saw Steve Jarvitson gave his uh, prototype number one, the true number one. Um, you know, mine was the first one available to the public in the signature series. He gave his to I think the Peterson Museum, and so I think that's probably if he puts his in the Peterson, maybe I'll give mine to the Smithsonian or somebody who wants it to put it on display because what Elon's accomplished with those companies is hard fought and he suffered immensely to do it. A uh, great personal sacrifice on his part. And so I think he, the world owes him a great debt because global warming is real. So if people don't believe that, um, and just on a pollution basis, there's no reason not to move to EVs. There's no reason to be spewing, you know, all this exhaust into the world. It's a much better world to have electric cars. Everybody can agree on that, even if you don't believe in global warming. And so uh, this is going to, you know, let everybody live a couple extra years and maybe save the planet if we can really adopt this stuff. At a minimum, you know, places like Shanghai or Los Angeles where the amount of smog was taking years off people's lives. There was a study from Berkeley who was saying something like seven years in Shanghai. And now that pollution is not just cars, it's also factories. But the, the concept is the same. If we can use some clean energy, we'll get rid of pollution and people will live longer. And I think that's incredibly noble. Yeah. And you know what I also like about that story, too, is just like the loyalty. You all have been friends for decades, too. And I want to just ask you this because I've been watching um, what's been playing out um, for the last couple of weeks. Like, OK, there was the deal book summit. Um, and then, you know, Bill Ackman, who's been on this show, he had a tweet about like why why the media always attacks Elon and tying it back to a lot of it when they criticize him I suppose it's the incentives or they get the clicks or whatnot I do want to get your perspective on it like why do you why do you think they always go after Elon well you know anybody who achieves greatness um, is going to be uh, going to get scrutiny anybody changes the world that comes with the territory so that that's the baseline uh, there's nothing wrong with that um, and then if you are outspoken you'll get a little bit more and then, you know, there's also the media's part. And so it's a multiple factor kind of situation. Um, he's outspoken. He's changed the world in many ways. And then, you know, there's clicks in economics. So if you present things in uh, a certain light, they're going to get more clicks. And, and you know, that that's something that was actually pioneered on the right, by uh, Rupert Murdoch and Fox. They re- And I, I come from a media background, so I remember this happening, you know, early in the 90s. Fox was like, we don't need the whole audience. We'll 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 get rid of two thirds of the audience, but we're going to own the conservatives. So we're going to get those conservatives. We're going to own them, and um, you know, uh, we we the way to own them is to upset the other side. <laughs> and then over time, you know, people who are moderate, left leaning, which might be New York Times, moderate right leaning, Wall Street Journal. I'm not sure where Washington Post actually that. Felt like it was down the middle. Atlantic might be moderate left. Uh, New Republic might be moderate right. Or that might have been a little further right. Anyway, everybody just realized, wait a second. If we are anti-Hillary Clinton or anti-Trump, we'll get more subscribers, more clicks. And so everybody just took Rupert Murdoch's playbook and went for it. From the New York Times to the Washington Post. I mean, they literally put up ads, join the resistance, subscribe, right? So if you want to stop Trump, you subscribe place your bet on us. We'll do more great coverage of the anti-Trump stuff. And, and you know, some of the anti-Trump stuff is very important for us to investigate, dare I say, <laughs> Russiagate. Like Paul Manafort was as dirty as dirty comes. This guy was taking data and giving it to Ukraine, Russian people. You know, there there was Russian interference. And did it make a difference? Probably not. But the Russians were trying and, and they had infiltrated a lot of Trump's inner circle. You can make your own determination if Trump knew or not. I would lean towards he did. Uh, he hired Paul Manafort. Guy went to jail and got pardoned. I'm super dirty. Uh, and so, you know, you, you do need to have politicians under scrutiny. I do think like if Hunter Biden is using the presidency to, you know, sell, get money from Russians or Ukraine or China, whatever it is, that's dirty too. So uh, you do need to have the, the, the journalists out there investigating. But the problem is they will pick the side. And it's really heartbreaking to watch. And it goes back to tech yeah. and dollars and cents. I think they would have stayed in the middle if they had the advertising dollars and if they had the classified ads business. But if you look at what happened, Craigslist uh, and Yahoo Classifieds, eBay stole the classified business that gutted a third of the revenue at newspapers. 
And then Google and Facebook ads gutted the other third. And then it was just, you know, 20% of the revenue left for newspapers. And if you're a marketer, it's probably more efficient just to buy Google, Facebook, Instagram ads and put your stuff on Craigslist or Facebook marketplace if you're selling stuff. And so yeah, I think that is uh, the big problem in journalism is they got desperate yeah. and then they just went for picking a side because they had to survive. And, and that, that is a big part of mm. this. Um, doesn't mean there's not principal journalists everywhere doing a fantastic job. There are. But incentives matter. And if you look at something like CNN, and this isn't conspiracy theories, uh, this is just brass tacks. I've been a publisher and a producer of media my whole life. If any one advertiser is a disproportionate amount of your revenue, in the case of CNN Pharmaceuticals, uh, I think they were over 50% of the advertising on CNN and other news networks. They're not the only one. Uh, what's going to happen? Mm, if you uh, want to do a segment on you know, something that's against SSRIs or you know, any other you know, opioids, uh, Oxycontin, et cetera, there's going to be some forces, spoken or unspoken, that are going to steer you away from that. And it's very hard for most people who have a five or $10 million contract as a news anchor or making a half million dollars running as producer of a show to not feel that subtly. Uh, unconsciously, consciously, unspoken, spoken, whatever it is, you know where the bread is buttered. And so it gets really hard uh, to, to uh, work against that. This is where subscriptions could be the solution and where independent media like podcasts like we're doing right now, I think do mm -hmm. um, are starting to emerge to fill that void. And so like you know, if I read ads for LinkedIn uh, jobs, which is the best job board. I use it all day long. Like, am I compromised? Probably not. You know, like I'm not, I can tell you right now, my opinions are not formed by the advertisers on this week in startups. Uh, now, at this point in my life, but if I was a younger podcaster and that's how I paid my mortgage, I'm going to pay for my kids, you know, school or whatever. And, you know, I had, I don't know, Casper mattresses and that, that was my, I may not say something bad about Casper mattresses because I, I need the money, right? And so it's very subtle how these forces are at work. And there are other forces that I face in my life today that are also uh, pernicious and try to guide coverage, et cetera. Uh, they're just different, right? They may not be as economically based. They may be social influence based or other things, but yeah. yeah. I think people are now figuring out their own media yeah. diet and podcasts are, and long form podcasts specifically are a big part of that. Yeah, I'm actually, so I'm sitting here, I'm, I have my journalism degree hanging on the wall here. I was a journalist. It used to be like something I was so proud of. Like it was a moniker I was really proud of. And then over the years, I, and I, maybe I'll get in trouble for even saying this out loud, but I'm going to say it with you on. Yeah, it's like, i not as proud of it as I used to be. Um, but I do hear your point. I see like the rise of independent creators. Because if you asked me like, I don't know, 10 years ago that, oh, I'd be hosting a podcast. I would be like, oh, really? Because like, I would have thought, oh, I want to be on a major network or something. But now I'm like, I think that's the way out is the indi individual independent creator path. And I kind of feel for people who haven't been mm -hmm. able to go out and build their well, own look, You brand. have your podcast, you control it, you can pursue your own views, you can be your own boss. And I'm guessing over time, whatever compensation you would have gotten from, from those networks after one to 10 years of doing this, you'll greatly exceed. And so I think for the truly talented well, people- this is a better path. Um, I, you know, I get offers, you know, to to do stuff on traditional cable TV and uh, you know reality TV, and you know, uh, I did a couple of little pilots and and was interested in it five or ten years ago, and and every year that goes by, it seems like what we're doing in podcasting is more uh, is is reaching more people. So what's the point? And then the amount of money I would have been compensated for doing a major network. Um, the major network reality show that I'd done a pilot for, I look back at the amount of money that they were offering, and it was not, I mean, it's great money, don't get me wrong, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars an episode. But that's the advertising every week on This Week in Startup. So it's it's actually like, okay, you know, I can do 10 episodes of that, or I can do my own show, you know, a couple of days a week and, you know, greatly exceed that. So the economics, I think, are steering towards the most talented people with, you know, um, the ability to do things consistently over time, which is what media is about. Can you do something consistently? You know, talk to me. I don't know how many episodes have you done. Um, your episode 125, and I started in um, August Perfect. of 2020. When you get to 100, 200, then that's when yeah. the good stuff starts happening. That's actually when it starts to click in. You get good Boom. at it. 
you start to get into a rhythm, you understand why people are listening, you build up a little bit of an audience, but most people don't make it past the fifth or 10th episode. So congratulations. Yeah. Well, like you said earlier, you have to keep going and do do the hard things. And I got to say, there were months where I was making very... I had a month where I made like $164 and I just felt terrible about it. I can't believe I said that out loud, but I said it and I'll be honest. Most I'll great things it. start um, from zero. And I was just struggling. Yeah, yeah I was struggling. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, zero at work, negative $500 a month is where most great things start. So if, you, if you're baked in all your yeah, time. Yeah, probably if I did a P&L statement, yeah, it was negative. That's, okay. that's called but investing yeah. in yourself. And you have complete ownership. Exactly. And you have complete integrity. So well, that's awesome. Well, let me ask you this too, because um, I'm starting to get more comfortable because even going back to like, sometimes it feels like there's certain areas that you, you fall in line because that's the narrative, if you will. And I'm getting more comfortable being able to like say what's on my mind. And it's kind of this notion of free speech as well. And I know that's something you all talk about on the All In podcast, but maybe I'm kind of equating it. Like when you get to a certain point, you're not beholden to like a paycheck or I could, if I say the wrong thing, what if I lose my job or that economic security? Is that ever something you kind of think about too? Because it's like part of that gaining success too, it kind of gives you that independence, if you will, or maybe I'm totally off here, but I want to hear if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well, I, I've been an independent content producer since the beginning. I started my own magazine, my own blogs, This my first podcast 13 years ago, 1800 episodes. So you know, I've always gone the indie route. Uh, you know, I am a DIY kind of guy. I like to understand every aspect of it. And so, you know, it's only been later in life that I've started engaging like true professionals in certain areas of my life, legal, accounting, et cetera. But I always like to figure things out for myself and bootstrap them uh, because I like to get my hands in there and understand how the engine works kind of situation. And I, I don't have anybody BS me. Like, I understand what it costs to produce a podcast. I understand how the microphone works. I understand the editing process. I think it's very important to understand every aspect of what you do and, and have some amount of proficiency in it. So back to what we're talking about with skills. You can become 60, 70% proficient at many, many skills in the world in weeks, I would say. Graphic design, writing, podcasting, uh, coding, you know, being a waiter, being a chef, I think you can get to 50, 60% proficiency in a month or two of dedicated, you know, time spent doing it, like to be a chef. Like I think, yeah, 30 days, you could be at the 50% point in the bell curve and maybe in 60 days you get to the 70%. That's very powerful. You don't have to be an expert on everything, but if you can get to, you know, a, a majority uh, knowledge of how to do a pursuit, it's a very dangerous uh, place to be, uh, you can you can be very dangerous in a good way in the world if you can uh, learn four or five different skills. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But it's kind of my philosophy of life. Yeah, no, you can you can um, gain skills. Just keep practicing. Okay, yeah. one final question for you, um, and this is going to be more of like an an sure. angel investing question. Um, you have this incredible book, so everyone go pick it up. Angel: How to Invest in Technology Startups. Timeless advice from an angel investor who turned hundred thousand into a hundred million. And reading the book, I'm sure it's actually higher than 100 million at this point. You've done quite well. But even just reading the book and you're sharing earlier, like your own story growing up in Brooklyn, um, being a night night student, um, you even had an anecdote in the book about you had a couple dollars, enough to buy the subway ticket and get the hot dog at the cheaper hot dog stand. Yeah. But when I was also, I was learning, you were an EMT, you were almost a police officer. Yeah. And I just kind of want to hear about what was it for you? Because I guess there are a lot of events in our lives and one little change could be a totally different outcome. What was it that got you on the path to where you are today? I know it's probably a series of events, but I'd love to hear. No, there is there are sliding doors, butterfly effect kind of uh, moments in my in my life story. Uh, when I was young, I started practicing martial arts, Taekwondo, uh, and had a great instructor, and that kind of made me super disciplined in my in my teenage years. And then, you know, I had grown up around my grandfather was a firefighter and a bunch of cops, growing up in Barrage, Brooklyn, and I thought that was a pretty good path. And I was told, you know, by my mentors, like you want to get a job with a pension, and so I took the fire, I took the police test. It was impossible to get into the firefighters in the eighties. It was just too good of a job. 
Uh, and so my brother and I, my little brother, Josh, he went into the police department and I considered it, uh, but I had gotten accepted at the last minute into Fordham at night and I wanted to go to Fordham. So I went at night and then I wanted, then I decided to be an FBI agent um, and I was going to do forensics and computer forensics. And I was fixing laser printers and doing programming because I was always a computer kid and hacker of, of sorts uh, when I was growing up in the 80s. And it was just a great way to make money to pay for college. So I was doing the bar backing, carrying cases of beer and ice up from the basement at the Salty Dog in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and then fixing laser printers. And then fixing laser printers turned into putting network cards into computers and networking. And then I got a job at Amnesty International doing databases of human rights violations. And I, I just kept leveling up in that field. And I went from you know making you know I don't know eight nine ten bucks an hour being a bar back to making twelve bucks eighteen bucks. 25 bucks an hour being a programmer. And I just saw the internet when I was at Fordham. Uh, they had BitNet and ARPANET, the two precursors to the internet. This is before the web browser existed. This is 88 to 92. People could do send commands and send files. And there were news groups. And I was like, this is incredible. You can talk to anybody around the world. And then online services happened. And so being in New York, when CD-ROMs, the internet happened, it just captured my imagination. So instead of get going to John Jay to do a master's in forensic psychology, I never really told the story, and then you know had the FBI application filled out and uh, was going to try to get to the FBI and, and do John Jay at night. And uh, I started a magazine about called Cyber Surfer about online services and CD-ROMs, and that lasted five issues, and then eventually did the Silicon Alley Reporter, which became a color glossy magazine with seventy five employees and twelve million in revenue you know, when I was in my mid twenties. And so, you know, once you get going on entrepreneurship, it kind of makes it hard to work in another organization because you get to create the world you want. Um, and yeah, I just feel very lucky that I was at the right place at the right time. And um, I, I desperately wanted to be uh, famous, powerful and make money because growing up in Brooklyn, I was powerless, didn't have money. <laughs> I was far from famous, and I just kept studying how, how is fame and power and wealth uh, accomplished. And for some perverse reason, I saw magazines as a venue for that because you could start a zine. This is before the web, but you could start a magazine called a zine by photocopying it, and you would put it on a stand at Tower Records, and you could sell it. But you didn't need to be color glossy magazine, so I started with just a photocopy, and that like was a super unlock for me. I was like, wait a second. Spy Magazine and Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair and Paper Magazine are controlling culture in New York. How do you get on the cover of a magazine? And then I met David Hershkowitz and he was running Paper Magazine and Kim and they explained to me how magazines work. And I was like, wow, that's true power. In my warped mind, I thought the most powerful person in New York is the person who picks up who's on the cover of magazines, John Wenner, it's great in Carter. And I was kind of right. There is something about the power of media. And this is when I was 22 or 23 years old. I realized this and I was like, I got to do that. And very quickly, it worked. So when I did the first issue of Silicon Eye Reporter, which was a 16-page photocopy, I had taken a bunch of early copies of the photocopies to Roseland. And I, there was an internet party, early internet party going on like 1995. And they gave it out at the party. And I looked around this party and at one in the morning in a club, music venue, there were hundreds of people around everybody holding up the magazine, reading it, because nobody had ever seen the magazine about the internet and their friends were in it. I looked around and I was like, whoa, power. I've got power. So it's just like, whoa, this is incredible. People are reading my magazine and they're coming up and wanting to talk to me. And all of a sudden I had 20 people around me for the first time in my life and they all wanted to be in the magazine. And I was like, I figured it out. If you have a magazine, you have power. I did it. And it was like the first time you kind of figure out the Rubik's cube, or you make a perfect stake, or you you know win Jenga, or you know understand poker. It was almost like a savant-like moment for me, and then that just set me off. I'm like, well, wait a second, what else can I do here? How much more power, money, and fame can I accomplish? And it was a very immature, you know, based level of thinking, but it got me through my 30s. And then, you, you know, I had to change my motivation and go after some other things, um, like having purpose, right? And, and it, you know, that, that kind of competitive, you know, fear of being poor, that can drive you a little bit. 
but then if you're good at what you do, you, you will not be poor for long and you'll get fame or some amount of it and you get some amount of power pretty quickly if you have money in the United States. And so then you have to find a new motivation, purpose, you know, camaraderie, enjoying the ride. And so then, you know, I just tried to find higher levels of motivation later in my career, but it was quite a journey and I feel very, very lucky. And I think a lot of it has to do with my mother was extremely hardworking as a nurse, always had three or four jobs. So I had her work ethic and my dad with no business education had started two bars that did incredibly well that people loved and he figured out product market fit. So I watched my dad figure out product market fit in these bars from a very young age. Uh, and he was very, very powerful, like presence. And uh, I just took those two things and combined them. And so it all goes back to your parents as you would expect. Wait, what's the motivation today? Great question. The purpose. Question. Um, I uh, made a list of all the things I enjoy doing, made a list of all the things I don't enjoy doing after my friend Tony Sh Shea passed away, the founder of Zappos, three years ago on my birthday uh, or the day before my birthday. He passed away on... He, I think he actually technically died on the 29th. They had him alive for a couple of days, but I think he actually went to coma on the 27th. My brother's on the 28th. That was during COVID 2020. And uh, when he died, it really rattled me and I just took an inventory. Life is short. I'm not going to be here much longer. What gives me joy? What do I find really annoying? Which people are amazing people to spend my time with? Which people are detractors in my life and, and just are not a net positive? And I just ruthlessly went through those lists. And my goal right now is to learn and to hang out with the people I love and do the things I find the most joyful. And, uh, you know, I set some personal goals. Like I'd like to be the greatest investor in the history of Silicon Valley. Um, but, you know, I kind of make those goals up to give myself at least a target or something ambitious to go for. Um, but I want to enjoy myself every day. I want to wake up with enthusiasm and be excited to start the day. I looked at my calendar today and I saw this and I was like, oh, wow, this can be a great conversation. Can't wait. Uh, so like that's a kind of a really amazing place to be or taking my daughter skiing uh, or being able to go to Niseko and ski in Japan and then uh, going with Tucker this year to go skiing with Tucker Carlson in Japan. That may or may not be true. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm manifesting. We want to see I'm pictures. Maybe me and Tucker will go to Niseko together <laughs> and ski Hokkaido. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, later in life, you should take that into account and, you know, I, my wife and I talked about me retiring possibly and I gave it some thought and it's like, you know what? I enjoy these things and I don't enjoy these things. So if I just eliminate these, outsource them, stop doing them, this will be even richer. And um, you know, I wasn't able to do that early in my career because all those chores would fall on my plate, didn't have the resources to outsource those. So I'm trying to find all the things that are annoying and not joyful and get rid of them. It's not easy. Um, you still have to do your chores in life, but you know, with a little bit of so, resources, you can get rid of a lot of them. So true. Well, Jason, don't <laughs> retire because I think when you guys, the besties are in your 90s, we'll still be coming out to the so. All In Summit. I, so. I just, I think it's like one of those iconic events, kind of like the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting of sorts where we make a pilgrimage. And so keep doing it. Um, a lot of us are getting you know, I, I was very proud of the first one I did. Um, and uh, the second one, Freeburg, you know, I was like, I wonder if he's going to be able to pull this off. And he wildly exceeded, you know, the high expectations of the audience and myself. And, uh, you know, it's really nice to have a partner like David Freeberg, who, you know, it's a new experience for me. You know, I built something and then it's like up to me to make it grow and do better. And he actually took the work I did on the first role in Simon in Miami mm -hmm. and then made it even better. And I was so proud of him. And then, you know, if you look at the podcast, I may have helped on one of the guests oh, on helping really? get, like, one of the guests. Really? Who, which one? Mm -hmm. Made a little intro. Oh. I don't know if I can oh, say. Oh, okay. Right. One of, yeah. Maybe somebody who's been on your pod. I don't know. Someone who's been on my okay. show well, Bill on Ackman episode has, 68. Yeah, Bill Ackman. No, no, no. You should get Bill Ackman he's for sure. Come. Yeah, I was just DMing with him. I think okay. he's a, he's, he'll be an amazing guest, but he really just did such an amazing job. And then if you look at the pod currently. Okay, it was the Ray, Ray Dalio, Dalio Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. this is exactly my point. Um, oh, he closed the deal. Yeah, I just helped make the Which intro. is fantastic. I mean, that's how it yeah. all starts. And, you know, he um, Ray Dalio was just was the first speaker and he he, he set a great tone. So Tremendous. it was amazing yeah. to have a partner like that. And then if you look at Saks, People don't see it, but Sax does an amazing job editing the show with producer Nick every week, and he puts hours into really making it crisp for everybody. 
um, and listenable, et cetera. And then, you know, Chamath is responsible for all these amazing guests we've been getting of late, you know, um, Tucker and I think Dean Phillips, uh, not sure about Vivek and RFK, but I think those might've been Chamath as well. Uh, so, you know, to yeah. have partners who are, you know, able to contribute and to make this thing incredible uh, is just incredibly rewarding for me because it's a new experience. And so that's the benefit of like having four people in the band who are just incredibly capable. And so, you know, I'm really committed to trying to keep the band together and to, to keep the brand, uh, you know, and the community together and, and make everybody really, um, it's just great to see everybody performing at a high level. You know, and I, I try to challenge mm-hmm. myself every week to be a better moderator. You know, I take notes every week. How do I get better? I ask the guys, how can I be better? You know, I look at the audience reaction. I'm always trying to get a little bit better as the as the point god. <laughs> it's the world's greatest moderator. <laughs> you are the world's Thank greatest you. moderator and point guard. And I have to say, Jason, it has been an absolute Thanks pleasure just spending me. this time yeah. with you, learning from you. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and all of your ideas how and many insights. Besties I have really, you really appreciate now? you. Am I the second? I've had two besties. I'm a Friedberg stand, so oh. I have Friedberg. <laughs> And then you, oh, right. I've interviewed Chamath before, but that was <laughs> when I was um, at, in the media. Would love to have Chamath and Sax mm-hmm. on. So yeah, I think I'd Lex love to get the besties. has had me and Chamath, but I don't yeah. know if he had Freeberg or Sax yet. Ooh, you have me and be Freeberg, but not Chamath and Sax. We should do. I would love, and maybe I should have Lex Friedman. Well, I'm no. Yeah, I'm just he's thinking. I look up to. If anybody has had all four of us on, I'm trying. I mean, obviously, like CNBC has, but. I'm not sure if any podcast has got collected all four. So you are in the running. You and Lex Ooh, are in the running to collect all four. I got to work on four. that. Okay. Collect it all might four. be a little like race here. Cards. Thank you for having me. There you go.